Okay, then let me go quickly to someone named Don Wright, who saw the plane crash into the Pentagon. Don, are you there in Washington? Yes, I am. Can you tell us what happened? Yes, it was about 9.35, and I was looking out our 12th floor windows at 1600 Wilson Boulevard in uh, Roslyn, Virginia, and I watched this. It looked like a commuter plane, two engines come down from the south, real low, uh, proceed right on and crash right into the uh, Pentagon. Went directly into the Pentagon? Uh, that is correct. Looked like a deliberate act? A deliberate act, sir. And can you tell me what direction it came from, Don? It came, it came from the south. Came from the south, up along the river, across the land. It came. It came from the south. Okay. And do you, do, did you happen to look at your watch? To, we thought it was just a little bit before ten o'clock. Well, I was watching ABC News, watching the uh, Twin Tower, uh, and about and about the time I saw the plane, I watched it come in very low over the trees, and it just dipped down came down right over 395 right into the Pentagon. And are you fairly sure that it was what we sometimes describe and recognize as a yes, small commuter plane? Uh, yes, it was. Good, Don. Thank you very much. Appreciate your help. You're Don very Wright, welcome. an eyewitness to the crash at the Pentagon. Now, we have had, as I said, reports today. There are hundreds of reports flying around, and so we beg your indulgence on us saying as often as we do, these are reports, they're sometimes unconfirmed, they're sometimes confirmed, we'll try to make it absolutely clear what we absolutely know and what we're uncertain about. There are now reports around of three aircraft having been hijacked today. So we have at least, because we've now had eyewitnesses to three de apparently deliberate uh, aerial assaults involving the aircraft themselves, two on the trade towers, in New York City and one on the Pentagon itself, just described by Don Wright as a small two-engine commuter plane which came up from the south. And we now believe that three planes were hijacked, two of them from Boston and one from somewhere else. We are not yet sure uh, precisely what's happened. Um, John, you're listening. Uh, just to uh, clarify for people, John, who's a who's uh, our, one of our leading reporters on crime, uh, knows New York City probably better than anybody in, in many news divisions. Uh, I cannot tell you where that happens. That's either U.S. Uh, uh, Air Force or Navy aircraft, uh, fighter aircraft, uh, now on patrol in what we've described as the no-fly zone uh, over New York City today, lest there be one more attempt. John, go ahead. Uh, they've continued evacuations in the area now. They've, uh, they're evacuating Battery Park City, which is a large apartment complex uh, taking up many blocks across the street from the World Trade Center. And uh, they've evacuated the federal court buildings where the terrorism trials of Ramzi Youssef and others were held. Uh, anything that could be a symbolic target is now being emptied out in New York. New York is, is going into kind of a lockdown mode. I think you'll also see in Washington the same kind of air patrols have been uh, scrambled around uh, principal buildings there. Okay. We have on the phone one of those people who, who uh, makes his living analyzing terrorism. Um, Kyle Olson, do you hear me? Yes, I do. I, I, I wonder if on a day like this anybody wants to be thought of as an expert on terrorism. Um, be that as it may, and assuming that, and knowing that much of the country is shocked at the uh, apparent breadth of this, are you? Well, you know, this is a, this is the the kind of thing that uh, that has fallen more into Tom Clancy novels than into uh, into actual response planning. Um, having said that, we've been anticipating for a long time. We've wondered why it's been so relatively quiet. Uh, the act, the suggestions of Osama bin Laden's involvement. What has he been doing since Cole? Uh, other other groups out there with uh, with a, a real or imagined grudge against the United States. Uh, the nature of the event is shocking. The uh, the fact that it's happened is not. Thank you very much, Kyle. Really appreciate it. Kyle Olson. Yeah, one, uh, one quick thing. Yeah, go ahead. One quick thing. The, accus the suggestions that are floating around out there right now, there's apparently this claim from the, uh, from the Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine. Right. Um, very interesting to yes, know. If, if, this is, if this is legitimate, if this, is, if this claim stands up, this appears to be okay. the first time this group has targeted Americans. This group has primarily steered away from the more extreme end of the, of the violence scale. They focused less on suicide bombings, more on uh, more on on gun attacks and and that sort of thing in the territories against Israelis. Well, if, if it, this holds it, up, this is a different. This is a very different tactic. Well, it. if it is true, and of course, the Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine was very much involved in attacking aircraft in the 1970s, which carried Americans. So certainly, would accept your notion that it's a recent attack on on Americans. Thank you, Kyle, very much. You bet. Um, uh, as as Mr. Olson makes clear, there has been at least one claim. 
And those of us who cover this for a very long period of time are always suspicious of claims. Uh, people who cover international terrorism. I'm going to interrupt myself. Linda Douglas, our Capitol Hill correspondent, I think is on the phone. And if she's not, she already reports there has been an explosion of some kind at the Capitol. Is Linda Douglas on the telephone? Uh, let's get her on the phone as quickly as we have. She just reported a couple of minutes ago that the leaders of the Congress, uh, Senator Lott, Senator Daschle, the Republican and Democratic leaders in the Senate, had been taken to some un or have been taken to some undisclosed, secure location. Um, our general assumption is that there's no panic involved in this. That somebody in the Capitol building, as someone in the Washington in the White House has a book which says that when these things happen, here, Thomas, maybe you can confirm this for me, when these, these things happen, there are certain modalities which you behave, and as you see the hierarchy of the American political establishment, the military establishment being attacked, you want to protect the chain of command. Absolutely. The first thing they try to do is to get everyone in secure positions so they can gather information and um, make decisions about what to do next. Uh, one of the things that law enforcement officials had been planning for is the notion of a multi-tiered attack. Uh, an attack occurring in multiple places simultaneously because one of the things they've talked about is that terrorists want to project more fear as much fear as possible and one of the ways you can do it is to have this notion that attacks are happening on multiple fronts yeah well and, and there, we've never seen anything like this before in the united states of course and, and in fact not seen anything like this in my reckoning i've been doing this for thirty some odd years i don't recall any multitude of attack we've had two or three we've had two suicide bombers within a in a short period of time in the Middle East. Uh, we had the two embassies uh, in Africa, uh, in Kenya and in Tanzania, the attack two summers ago in the United States. But the notion that uh, the terrorists, either an organization or organizations, plural, uh, should be able to mount a concerted effort against the United States in this way, causing in this instance so many casualties, in the, in the instance of the Trade Tower, certainly so many casualties, is, is going to astound people in the political and military and, and intelligence establishment. Absolutely. The notion that you could have multiple attacks like this, they had been planning for it, they had not seen it. Um, this is an extraordinary escalation, one that they were, they were predicting would happen, but no one would think that would happen this quickly. Okay. John Miller? I think... Uh, right, let me just interrupt. I sure. apologize again. We're now looking at a, a helicopter over the Pentagon. That makes perfect sense this morning. But given the fact that we're all sensitive to the presence of any aircraft, uh, that was a helicopter that just flew across the screen. That is, and as we had one, at least one eyewitness said this was an attack on the Pentagon from the south. He described it quite confidently as resembling a commuter aircraft, which is to say smaller than a small private aircraft and not as large as a commercial jet. It may have been a, a prop jet. Um, it may have been a jet, but it's a smaller version of the jets which so many people in so many middle-sized American cities are now accustomed to seeing. In terms of the realm of terrorism, this is going to be a real uh, first test, uh, literally by fire, for the Bush administration. You recall, after the embassy bombings in East Africa, uh, the Clinton administration uh, waited about 10 days and launched a missile attack against the camps of Osama bin Laden, who they felt confident at that time they could say was responsible for it and who's since been charged in it. Uh, in this case, I think this ratchets up. Uh, Excuse me. This is the Pentagon we're looking at now, according to my uh, according to my monitor. And again, it is hard to, to grasp what part of the building. We do not know if they're in the courtyard or outside, but you can see that a fairly considerable amount of damage has been done. We do not know whether these are offices or storage areas. The Pentagon is full of uh, many thousands of people uh, every day. The Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld, has been saying only yesterday and today that he wants to reduce the, uh, the bloatedness, as he put it, as he alluded to it in the military and the bureaucracy. But this is the great home of the, of the military bureaucratic establishment. Um, John, before I come back to you, uh, Dennis Cross is on the phone. Dennis, do you hear me? Dennis Cross, do you hear me? Yes, I can, Peter. Dennis, I understand that you were in the World Trade Center when either this or these attacks occurred. Am yeah, I correct? That, that's correct. It was, uh, I guess it was slightly before 9 o'clock, and uh, I work on the 36 form, One World Trade Center. I work for in the insurance industry. Probably hundreds of people uh, in my industry uh, in both of these two buildings. 
And what was ha what happened? Um, as I was. Uh, hey, Dennis, just let me stop for a second. Um, somebody is trying another telephone on this line. Could they please not do that while we listen to Mr. Cross? Thanks. Go ahead, Mr. Cross. Go ahead, Dennis. Uh, essentially, I was, uh, you know, sort of at my desk working, general office activity, and uh, felt an enormous. Uh, so I, it almost felt like an earthquake. Like I could literally feel and see things in the office moving and the floor moving. Um, immediately after what it was some sort of explosion or something uh, there was an enormous volume of debris and paper it almost looked like a dirty parade uh, all of this material just falling down I, I was looking out the uh, south side of the uh, of one world trade and uh, everybody in the office was kind of screaming kind of gathering in the middle and I went to the window and uh, I immediately saw one woman uh, who appeared to be motionless uh, laying on the roof of the of uh, you know a lower building next to me. Um, at that point, everybody started to gather the things. They were trying to evacuate people down the stairwell. And what, did the light? Did the electricity go out in the building? Uh, the lights flicker, flickered a couple of times, and then it was weird. It was kind of like there was there was one uh, one sort of rush, and then shortly after that, there was another one. I don't know if it was maybe the other tower or if there were uh, elevators in the inside. Of it. Uh, you know, sort of just dropping to the floor. Now, are you aware that, that, that one of the Twin Trade Towers has now collapsed on itself? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm about uh, probably five blocks from there on the corner of Greenwich and Warren. And, and as, we, as we looked at it on the screen here, Dennis, we could see uh, the smoke from this collapse just sweep the billow forward through the lower blocks of Manhattan. Did you have a sense of that? Completely. I was, uh, at that point, I'm, I'm a little bit northwest, it's certainly north maybe to the west side of... Uh, uh, Tower One, and I was trying to get to Broadway. Uh, my wife works on the other side of downtown here. Uh, I'm still trying to get there, but the smoke, I literally, I couldn't see. It was a wall of smoke, and if you were in it, you couldn't see. If you were out of it, you could just see the wall of smoke. It was, how never difficult? Seen anything. I'm sorry for interrupting. How difficult was the evacuation? Up there. It's I'm how, sorry, say that again, Peter? How difficult was, was it to evacuate the building from at least from the 30... There were 110 stories in the building. It, I would say that it wasn't, it wasn't extremely difficult. It was just uh, slow going down a somewhat narrow stairwell. With light, if there was any sort of, uh, you know, people who weren't able to move quickly, then it, it literally slowed down or stopped everybody. Um, I was on 36, so it wasn't too terrible when I got down to, you know, the 15th or 12th floor or so. Uh, there was water coming in from the doors, you know, kind of at our feet level, uh, and then it just was a waterfall down all of the, continually down all of the stairs, probably, you know, in some cases three, four inches deep. At that, sirens and alarms are going off, uh, and then people started to get a little frantic there. Dennis, thank you very much. Okay, I, sure. I really appreciate you calling in, You're Dennis very Krause, who uh, who works uh, on or did work on the on the 36th floor of the World Trade Center. Uh, in this particular tower, which is still standing. There's only one of the trade towers now standing, the other having collapsed on itself um, uh, not long ago. All of the federal office buildings in Washington have now been evacuated. All federal buildings in Washington have now been evacuated. All aircraft in the skies over the United States have been ordered to land at the nearest airport. Uh, all aircraft on the ground intending to go anywhere have been ordered not to take off uh, because the country, this is the Pentagon, because we've just seen a moment ago that at least one portion of one side or building at the Pentagon itself uh, has actually uh, collapsed. <clears throat> and as we warned you, the whole business of responsibility, claiming of and naming responsibility would be complicated. And now we've, uh, from from the Middle East, a senior official from the from the Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine has denied any uh, involvement, any connection to a double plane crash on the World Trade Center. It was, in fact, earlier on an anonymous caller who had called Abu Dhabi Television <coughs> to say that the, uh, the DFLP was responsible. So for today, we'll put uh, aside as best we can the uh, trying to understand who did it, just knowing. Uh, somebody who did it. Now, uh, one of the planes that crashed into the World Trade Center was, uh, as we as we said some while ago, American Airlines Flight 11 from Boston, Boston to Los Angeles. Uh, that has now been confirmed by the airline itself, um, or at least by their spokesperson, Lori Bassani. 
Um, it was a Boeing 767. It would, under normal circumstances, if it were full, carry about 160 passengers, including two pilots, nine or ten crew, but we have no idea yet whether or not the plane was heavily loaded or not. Peter, Peter uh, big concern now from the scene that the Northwest mm -hmm. Tower, the one remaining standing, is, is leaning over. and uh, buckling in the, uh, in the Northwest corner. Um, they're moving back the mobilization areas and they're cordoning off the area in a much wider zone now because obviously they're, they are now concerned about the possibility mm -hmm. of a second collapse. I I'm still desperately confused, John, about what may have caused the building to, to collapse. Um, As you watch <clears throat> the videotape, it appeared to buckle from the middle, from the point of <clears throat> impact and, um, and collapse, which, uh, not, you know, with no background in architecture, I don't know about the structural vulnerability, but as you, as you see, debris just starts to, to peel fall, away. then it cracks, and then it just goes straight down. And now uh, they say that the, the other tower is leaning. Um, if you look at some of the pictures, it appears to be on a slight angle uh, to the right. Yeah, they, uh, they say the fire is also spreading downward now through the tower. And I, I think there's a real decision to make there. I have not been able to, to hear whether they're keeping people in there to fight that fire or they're just leaving it empty to let the fire burn itself out because they're going to have a real problem with people in there if it's in jeopardy. At the same time, uh, New York firefighters have a reputation of staying until the very end. And if there are civilians in that building which need to be rescued, and clearly there are, then there's no way the emergency services, I can imagine, are going to, to uh, pull out at this point. Tom, and if the elevators are disabled uh, from that height, there's no fast way out. Precisely. 110 stories uh, down, and this appears to have occurred, this, did, this, this occurred about two-thirds of the way up. ABC's John McQuethy now confirms for us, we've had from an eyewitness, or he adds to our eyewitness, uh, saying uh, that a small plane heading north, which is exactly what our eyewitness um, a little earlier uh, told us, uh, exploded at the base of the Pentagon, at the base of one wing of the Pentagon. They evacuated everyone inside, and there was a subsequent concern, which may have led to the FAA decision to ground everything, uh, that there was concern that another plane uh, might be inbound uh, towards the Pentagon. And by grounding everything, of course, by ordering everything to be grounded on all radio channels to all aircraft that are flying in the area, it puts the military, uh, Pierre Thomas confirmed for me, it puts the military in a position to take aggressive action, uh, as the White House did when, that, when, that, uh, when other aircraft have come close in the past. Absolutely, absolutely. What it allows them to do is to get a better sense of incoming. If you're ordering everything down, you're essentially clearing the sky so the Pentagon can see what's coming in. Another question that they have to look at here is whether any of these planes might have been laced with explosives to cause the additional collateral damage once the impact occurred. Yeah, these, these in every instance, well, I shouldn't say in every instance, certainly in the instance of the Pentagon, it looks more than a single aircraft just exploding on the ground. But again, we don't know precisely the size of the aircraft. Um, we won't speculate on that. But Lisa Stark, who covers aviation for us, confirmed that it was American Flight 11 to Los Angeles. There were 90 passengers and crew on board. Um, and there was a second plane. Help me understand this not. So we believe that the two aircraft have flown into the trade towers. Both belonged to American Airlines. And they had both been hijacked, and there were 90 passengers and crew on the first plane and 60 passengers and crew on the second plane. That is the, if there's any doubt about that, someone please contradict me, but that is the report I am getting from our people who cover the Federal Aviation Administration and air travel in general, that there were two aircraft hijacked for this attack on the twin trade towers, now the single trade tower in New York City, and on the first, they were both flights to the west coast from Boston, and the first one had 90 people and a crew on board, and the second had 60 passengers and crew on board. I beg your pardon. The second plane was not hijacked from Boston, but from American, from Dulles Airport, we're being told, which of course is outside Washington, and we do not know if that was the... Let me just, I'm going to make this absolutely clear because this reporting gets muggy. We've, we've now reports of two planes from American Airlines, one 
from Boston, Flight 11 to Los Angeles, which we believe is one of the aircraft that went to the Trade Towers. We have a second plane, American Airlines Dulles to Los Angeles, with 60 passengers and crew, and that is certainly bigger than a small commuter aircraft, so it may also be involved in the near. We'll do our best to, uh, to hand that down as well. Um, senior law enforcement officials in Washington now tell us that a car bomb has exploded outside the State Department. That's a, uh, it's a report uh, now from uh, the Associated Press, uh, about to confirm it with our own people at the State Department, though everybody in Washington has been evacuated from their buildings. Um, but a car bomb has now exploded outside the State Department. And John Miller, I see you writing quite frantically on something else. It's uh, at the scene now at the World Trade Center. Because of the concerns of the structural stability of the remaining tower, a temporary headquarters mobilization point triage center was set up at Stuyvesant High School, which is about uh, uh, two and a half blocks up and slightly across the street. Um, now, the, uh, now the concern is that if the building falls, if the second building falls, that it will be falling in that direction. So they are now evacuating their own command post and triage center, and they have to find an even further zone to move that to. Something that is striking about this today is that this is indicative of, with a car bomb at the State Department, a plane crash into the Pentagon, two planes designated to crash into each tower of the World Trade Center, bringing one down. It, it connotes the, the level of planning and sophistication and um, extreme logistical ability that, that, that probably makes this singularly uh, the largest, most well-coordinated act of terrorism, uh, not just in U.S. history, but probably Certainly in modern in, times. In modern times, yeah, and, unprecedented. And, and, it's and, going to be. And every time you say that, I'm going to go immediately to Washington. Now, but every time you say that, I keep thinking of how we are told time and time and time again by the Pentagon and by the State Department that they know something's going Stand on by, in the uh, world today. They seem to have the North problem at the North Tower, uh, Peter. Let's look at the North, North Tower, Tower quickly. Seems quickly, to be coming down. Oh my God. The second, the second tower. It's hard to put it into words, and maybe one doesn't need to. Both trade towers, where thousands of people work, on this day, Tuesday, have now been attacked and destroyed with thousands of people either in them or in the immediate area adjacent to them. This is, there is simply no way to accurately describe the emotion this evokes in people all over the world, friends of the United States and enemies of the United States as well. John Miller, very briefly, you said to us just a few minutes ago that this was their concern, that they thought after the first tower went that the second one was vulnerable. There was uh, constant intelligence that uh, terrorist organizations, and uh, specifically that financed by Osama bin Laden, was trying to mount another series of attacks against the United States. Of course, they thought of the symbolic t targets. The most symbolic was the World Trade Center because it had been attacked yet not brought down. And um, it seems that those concerns that even caused the World Trade Center to hire a senior FBI counterterrorism official just weeks ago to try and beef up security um, have come home to roost. It's also interesting to say that there is no type of security which would have prevented against this today. Well, Nothing. that's that may not. That's I was going to say that may not be able to be true because security operates in waves and concentric circles out around the world. Now we've lost the picture from there, so now we have it again. Um, well, wh wherever you are in the United States or in the world today, you can the landscape of New York City has just been changed. And one has to assume that thousands of lives have been extinguished. 
it may be presumptuous to say thousands, but thousands of people work in these buildings, and it and we and, and given the difficulties of evacuating these buildings, where as we've said several times, the operate the elevators may not have been operating and were not operating in at least one tower, tower number two, the first one which is to go. Um, that is the second attack on the southern tower, the first higher on this end of the tower, but both those towers have now, have now, have now gone. And here's what, here's a, here's a picture that doesn't exist anymore because that's not a live picture anymore. The, uh, Good Lord, it just... Now, can I ask where this picture is from? Do we know where this is? This, this is... Uh, this is, this is outside the World Trade Center. The sign uh, indicates the approach to the, uh, the Brooklyn, Brooklyn Bridge. Bridge. To the Brooklyn Bridge. So we're... So we're, so we're on West Street, approximately uh, just north of VC Street there. And you can see the dust and debris. And this is at, I don't know if this is at an early stage or whether this is, is right now. It's at an early stage because there in the distance you can see the, at least one of the towers still standing as people wander many of them days and look at the cell phones in their ears this is in a cell phone society and it's certainly true in the Middle East people on their cell phones all the time seeking and offering reassurance to their families and their friends that something has happened in Israel and at least those with Heather in the Palestinian territories these days there's constant traffic on the on the cell phones because there is such tension in the region and such tension here today which is extraordinary the people wanting everywhere to reassure or find out about what has happened to those who are near and dear to them. Uh, let, let one me... thing we should update for people listening, particularly in this area, who may have been worried, uh, there was a concern that if this building... You mean in the New York City area? Yes. There was a concern if this building fell that it would land on uh, the center they had set up at Stuyvesant High School where the, the students were still there. The reports from Stuyvesant High School now are that uh, everybody there is okay. Stuyvesant High School, the high school in the adjacent area which the, the city and the state authorities set up to deal with the casualties that they could get out of the building or had occurred adjacent to the building. It is just clear that a lot of people, we do not know how many, uh, got out of the building. And it is going to take time. It is going to take time. The New York City Office of Emergency Management which monitors the city and all its vulnerable points said when this whole thing began this morning they could not get an immediate handle on, on precisely uh, what was happening and it was only you've seen this before this is a this is a recording of, uh, of precisely what happened when the second tower went down and this is from a very long distance this camera is located on the edge of the Hudson River on on, on the west side drive up the western side of Manhattan and I cannot say this is something that people never believed they would see in the United States because of course Oklahoma City was when we all had that reaction when Americans experienced terrorism in the heartland for the first time believing in many cases that it all happened somewhere else um, but I, but I just think that millions of Americans will be stunned by the magnitude of this today. Um, I'm trying to track down John McCarthy, our correspondent at the Pentagon. He was evacuated. I'm saying this as much to our control room as anybody. Um, he, like everybody else, was evacuated. I'd also like to talk, if I may, to Claire Shipman at the, at the White House um, to see what the progression is there. And Linda Douglas at Capitol Hill, because we do know that the leadership of the Senate, at least, Senator Lott and Senator Daschle were moved to a secure location uh, while much of this was going on, but it is very difficult to get through on anybody's cell phone. And 
This is Pierre Thomas, another reminder of, you wonder if this is something that people anticipate. We now live in the age of cell phone. We now rely on cell phone for so much. When there's chaos like this, too many people on the cell phones, they don't work. Well, one of the things that they had to deal with today, Attorney General Ashcroft was in route to uh, Milwaukee today. And now with the planes grounded, he's going to have to communicate by phone. Uh, they have an inter, uh, internal communication system at the Justice Department that they use in situations like this, video monitors. But again, everyone is dispersed, and with the planes grounded, this created a scenario that they, had, quite frankly, hadn't seen before. It is the grounding of the planes which pretty much brings to a halt. I mean, one assumes that Air Force One, with the president, is already on its way back to Florida. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. ABC's John McCrethy is on a cell phone at the moment, and while he cannot hear me, somebody can tell him to start talking, please, and we'll listen. Okay, we'll try that again. Anytime John McCrethy <coughs> begins to talk and tell us what's happening at the Pentagon, or as much as he knows what's happening at the Pentagon, we will simply... Uh, let him go, but uh, it's just very difficult to get through on cell phones. Thousands of people trying to find out where their where their friends and their relatives are. Thousands of of uh, reporters, uh, uh, news organizations, of uh, city organizations, state organizations, federal organizations, trying to understand um, not only what happened today, which in some respects is secondary, but to get something done. Um, and there's just so much agitation around. You get a report just a couple of moments ago from from the security at the Capitol Police saying that they believe a hijacked plane <coughs> may be bound for the Capitol. Um, it's, it's, it, there's an intensity in the air um, and a fear and a trauma in the air at, uh, at 20 minutes to 11 Eastern time in the United States, 20 minutes to 8 on the West Coast or in the Western part of the United States. The day has just getting beginning and all of this has happened in um, under just under an hour the first attack on the trade tower was uh, just before 10 o'clock the second one came at, at three minutes after 10 we have a strike on the pentagon which came uh, a little after that and the country is just riddled nine o'clock nine o'clock nine o'clock i'm sorry uh, the country is just um overrun as it's inevitable it would be with with, with rumors I i'm curious john in terms of the of the emergency operation that you monitor are they in a sense of panic or are they in a, or just in a sense of chaos? Uh, in a sense of chaos, uh, there was a, a brief sense of panic, which is understandable, when the first tower collapsed. By the time the second tower collapsed, they were prepared for it. Uh, there were numerous other injuries. The level of coordination is incredible. The FDR drive, which is a main artery, has been shut down for the purpose of um, keeping it clear for ambulances to go to uh, hospitals. Uh, they've anticipated that the lower men hot lower Manhattan hospitals in New York City will fill up so they have started to uh, arrange uh, helicopter flights to go to hospitals further out in the circle um, mm. they've really been they've really been pretty well coordinated throughout this if you can possibly be coordinated, coordinated. Uh, during a series of spontaneous events that amount to disaster this is war and in war by uh, mm -hmm. by another definition one of the we did manage to get we did manage to get rebecca cooper one of our reporters on the phone from the white house that's how difficult it is uh, at the moment to communicate rebecca do you hear me rebecca cooper at the white house do you hear me all right the same case with rebecca says with john mccrethy at the pentagon if we do hear from them we'll simply interrupt and let them and let them get Hello? on talking yeah, Rebecca, do you hear me? Yes, Peter, I hear you. I'm in the basement of 815 Connecticut Avenue. It's a building across uh, the block from the White House, across the park. It's, you know where that is, next to the Chamber of Commerce. I had to come down here because, as you said, none of the cell phones are working. I'm in the engineer's office, and they've given us our, their phones to use. There's a real dichotomy here at the White House, Peter. Tourists who still are not fully aware of what's happening across the nation are standing there watching with curiosity. They keep getting moved back. But those of us who were inside the White House realized the severity of the situation. I was inside the White House this morning trying to gather information for you when we were told by a very nervous uh, White House security staff that they feared a plane was headed to the White House, and we heard planes indeed overhead, and they quickly evacuated all of us out of the White House. Now, I just got off the phone with my own uh, crying mother who was very worried about where I was, and I will tell other mothers and fathers of people who work at the White House and reporters who work at the White House that most of the White House has been evacuated. In fact, in the building where I am now, 
uh, people have cordoned up other offices to try and coordinate the federal response to this. There are actually phone calls being placed to the legal counsel of the FAA from this building because they don't have cell phone connections. They are out of their offices. They are doing a good job of coordinating the federal response from here, but they are having to take all kinds of emergency measures to coordinate this response. But even uh, the White House chef, who just days ago was preparing a lovely state dinner for President Fox of Mexico, I saw him and I tried to speak to him. And frankly, Peter, he was too rattled. He said he couldn't speak and uh, he was with his staff. And they were all very anxious and very worried because, of course, they did know what's going on in the country today. Many thanks, Rebecca Cooper. And if you just see that picture that was going by as Rebecca was talking, you get a real sense of what the urgency was in the White House. First of all, the, you know, the White House police came walking out and then people began to run out of the White House. Um, in and of itself, astonishingly uh, astonishing because we, we live with the notion that if there is any place in the United States which is, which is fiercely protected, including um, an anti-aircraft uh, battery, at least one on the roof of the White House itself, this is the place where the president and the vice president, of course, are to be secure. Claire Shipman is on the phone from the White House. Claire, we are now looking at, at, at what appear to be fairly relaxed uh, uh, security officers on the roof of the White House, uh, looking at the, in the distance as they always do, talking occasionally to each other. There doesn't seem to be a high level of tension there. What's it like on the ground? Well, there is considerable tension on the ground, Peter. We are actually looking at a similar picture because we're across the street from the White House now in the Hay Adams Hotel. Um, the entire area around the White House has been completely evacuated. It's very quiet. The police seem tense. They're carrying automatic weapons. Um, we've also seen a couple of what appear to be fighter jets overhead. Uh, everybody in this area has been sent home from all major government offices. It's all a reverse commute. The highways, we're told, are just jammed. As you know, President Bush is on his way back to the White House. They've checked his plane considerably before um, sending him on his way. But as you mentioned, these guys on top of the White House roof are almost always here. and. Ever since that incident a few years ago, when a plane actually landed on the White House lawn, they've upped security measures so that they wouldn't have any other aircraft nearby. Uh, and that may be why they seem a little more relaxed than other areas around town. As you know, the AP has been reporting that um, there was a car bomb that went off at the State Department, and uh, a lot of people are talking about that. Uh, and, and there's also been some report that there were bomb threats on Capitol Hill, but we're still trying to find out more about that, Peter. Th thanks very much, Claire. There are indeed reports from the Federal Aviation Administration uh, that, that there are possibly one or two more planes that have been hijacked this morning and are still missing. When you think of the number of aircraft that crisscross the United States, not to mention fly overseas every day, uh, this is the Pentagon. This is the Pentagon. This is live coverage from the Pentagon now, which gives you some sense of the force with which this aircraft, described to us as a, as a small commuter-sized aircraft, uh, flew into a side of the Pentagon um, coming from the south this morning. And again, we, uh, the communications in the country are so, uh, are so difficult at the moment. And as you've heard from beginning to hear from everybody, the cell phone network uh, is choked for a variety of reasons, that it's hard to get a handle at this point on, on um, casualties at the Pentagon or the extent of damage. The one place on which it is, in which we can be focused because it is such a small place, Manhattan, 11 miles long, uh, um, is the Twin Trade Towers. And, and by some remote chance, if you've just joined us on television, the Twin Trade Towers in New York City have been destroyed with hundreds, presumably, or perhaps thousands of people in them. Each of the two towers was struck today, attacked today uh, by an aircraft, one of which at least we know was hijacked. And this is the second tower that went just uh, uh, a few minutes ago, uh, a scene of chaos and devastation uh, in, in, lower, in, in the lower part of New York City, right on the edge of the Hudson River. Everybody in the United States is familiar with the Twin Trade Towers. And, and, and we have no idea what, uh, w whether there were tourists there who sh show up every morning to go and stand on the top of the Trade Towers because it is one of the most expansive views uh, southwest and north 
uh, of the city of the area itself. Bill Blakemore is down there. Bill, do you hear me? I do, Peter. Go ahead. I'm just north of Canal Street, just a, uh, just a few blocks north of the Trade Tower area. Throngs of people have been, of course, moving north. Some of them silent, most of them looking stunned, just saying we're just trying to get out of the area after both towers have collapsed. We're seeing Delta Wing jet fighters circling overhead uh, just one at a time. When the first one appeared, the group of people amid which I was standing uh, shrieked and said, oh my God, there's another attack. And then they realized uh, that being a Delta Wing jet fighter, uh, it was probably the U.S. military, which of course it seems to be. There's just a couple of helicopters, apparently police helicopters circling overhead. And on this very clear morning now, the, the unusual sight is the lack of the trade towers sticking up above the buildings that are normally here. People have now begun to accept, but just barely begun to accept what's happened. All business at a complete standstill, nothing but sirens down here as these throngs move further and further north, just walking away from what they can barely begin to understand. Peter? Bill, how far north did the, the, this, I mean, we looked at some streets which debris had just gone in a huge wide area. Right. I seem to be just north of where that hit. Um, I'm just up a canal, so uh, there seem to have been enough low-lying buildings that is no more than, say, 20 or 30 stories high between us and the base of the tower to have protected people here from the debris. Uh, but here's another man walking past me, just just looking completely dazed, going north. Uh, two or three other women. The crowds are beginning to thin out now, as most of the people uh, who were just standing around and watching or working there. One woman came up, just talking a mile a minute with her daughter and her friend and her daughter, describing how they had gone to their school this morning. Uh, she was about to go to the trade tower. Uh, to pick up something from a shop there when her daughter said, I want a sandwich, Mommy, and so she stayed back. She said, otherwise I would have been there. They're still trying to understand uh, how they're so lucky not to have been over there. Uh, there must be thousands of such stories here this morning, Peter, of those that were the lucky ones. Thank you, Bill. Please stay in touch as often as you can. It's now 10 minutes to 11 Eastern time, 10 minutes to, to uh, east in... Uh, two minutes to eight in, in the West. Uh, and I'm just going to add to the chaos and the trauma of the day by saying that a large plane has now crashed uh, just north, or shouldn't I say just, but crashed about 10 o'clock in the last 15 minutes north of Somerset County Airport, uh, about 80 miles southeast of Pittsburgh. Um, this is, uh, this is um, reporting from one of the Pittsburgh television stations. Uh, as a result of a 911 call from the airport itself. There are no other details on this crash yet, um, and it's not clear whether the crash was related to anything else that has happened in the country today, uh, but the plane, which was believed to be a Boeing 767, uh, crashed about 8, 10 a.m., uh, just about eight miles uh, east of Jennerston, Pennsylvania, uh, people in the area will undoubtedly be reporting in more clearly to us on that. Um, the New York mayor's race is having a primary today. Uh, that has now been canceled, uh, both on the Republican and the Democratic uh, side. Uh, there was a, uh, a um, I apologize for interruption. Somebody's trying to say something. Go ahead, please. Okay, just stand by just for one second while I just finish. Just repeating, the New York Merrily primary has uh, been canceled to the, uh, today. And um, as we said, there's reaction coming in from, uh, from the Middle East, including a claim of responsibility, then a denied responsibility. Now a message from the Palestinian President Yasser Arafat condemning the aircraft attacks on the World Trade Center and, and sending the condolences of the Palestinian people um, to those who have been victimized by it. Um, outside the Pentagon, another member of our ABC News staff, Chris Dreer. Chris, can you hear me? Yes, I can, Peter. So would you uh, tell us what you can see? Yes, and Peter. I'm standing at the fringe of Arlington Cemetery watching the Pentagon as the top of it caves in. There's a lot of black smoke, a lot of twisted debris. The Pentagon itself has caved in from the top. There is much fire uh, coming out of the windows. Uh, it looks like uh, something from World War II, Peter. Um, Chris, uh, can you tell me, it's a little hard to tell on television, how much of the building has collapsed? How wide is it? How deep this, is it? Do you have a sense of that? 
Yes, I do, Peter. The center portion of the Pentagon appears to be breached. That is, apparently there's a courtyard, and the of that is completely caved in from where I am, from where I see it. Okay, I think you're on a cell phone, Chris, but just confirm for me that a portion of the building has been breached and the aircraft appears to have pushed its way through into the courtyard? Yes, indeed it has. I believe, Peter, that that's where the plane is, but I am not sure at this time. Okay, thank you very much, Chris. Is there any evidence, uh, is there any movement around there at the moment? We're looking at a fairly static picture. Are the people arriving, people disappearing, yes, ambulances no, coming? Peter, there's a great deal of glass and wind fire coming out of the, uh, out of the windows. But on the other side of the Pentagon is where most of the uh, emergency vehicles are now. I'm going to try and get around to that side to see what I can see. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I should tell you that all military personnel in the, in the District of Columbia area now, all military personnel in the district, are now on something that is called Threat Level Delta, which is the highest state of alert in the military. And all other people, all other military personnel in the country are now on alert status Charlie, which uh, John Miller we know is a, is a somewhat lower status of alert, but still a reminder uh, that, the, that this, this disaster has spread like wildfire through all of the political and military establishment in the country. All museums and monuments in Washington are now shut for the day. It's ironic to hear Claire Shipman telling us there that tourists are still standing around uh, waiting to get into the White House today. Uh, not surprisingly, unfamiliar, perhaps, with what has happened everywhere else, though, as it was, for example, when John F. Kennedy was assassinated, word spread dramatically, mouth, mouth to mouth, person to person across the country, in a huge, huge uh, wave of information and emotion and confusion. Um, and, and now I just want to sort of, as often happens, to contradict some of the earlier reporting um, from, from Washington. Our State Department sources now believe that there was no car bomb at the State Department, as, uh, as was reported a, a little earlier by a number of sources in Washington. We believe there was no car bomb at the State Department, uh, so the State Department at this point is free of violence, but it has been evacuated, uh, as has the Congress, as has the Treasury Building. And we've told you several times that the leadership of the, uh, of the House and the Senate, at least the Senate anyway, have been taken to... Uh, to a location which is deemed to be secure. There is still some concern uh, I among our intelligence sources in, in Washington that one more aircraft somewhere uh, is unaccountable, or is unaccounted for, I should just say. Um, Pierre Thomas, you're, and I know you're talking as best you can under the circumstances to all of your sources in the FBI. This is your beat. What are they telling you, if anything? Well, early on today they were saying that they thought that there was at least uh, at least one hostage uh, situation in terms of the plane being hijacked. Uh, but they were scrambling just as we are, trying to get additional communication, trying to get additional information. And that's one of the problems early on in a disaster like this, is they're trying to get the information in, they're trying to sort through what they have, and then make decisions based on that. Okay, but do you, it, it, does it appear to be an orderly procedure as far as you can tell throughout the country? Yes, the, what they do in these cases, the Special Operations Center, which is based at the FBI headquarters in Washington, will go on full alert. The FBI director, Deputy Director um, Tom Picard, uh, will come down. They will begin to uh, communicate with their facilities throughout the U.S. It's interesting to note, Bob Mueller, the FBI new director of the mm, FBI... Hardly been on the job at all. ...has not been on the job more than two weeks. So he's now being baptized by fire in terms of how to deal with a crisis like this. Okay, Pierre, thanks very much. Pierre Thomas, who covers the Justice Department and is sitting here working the phones trying to, trying to get through. Because in some respects, what you're looking at on, on television, with the one exception of the, of the collapse of the buildings in, in New York City in, in the last hour... Uh, is it, it doesn't convey, doesn't begin to convey, and nor can we, uh, the tension in, in the country um, from everywhere, because you not only have something happening, but you have all of this reporting coming in from, from otherwise, you know, from respectable intelligence, information, police agencies, saying there are other things to be worried about. John Miller, who's, who's sitting with me, covering New York City in his, in his ear, because he knows these police networks so well, had a sense that the second tower was going to go, and other people must have had the same thing. They did. Uh, the first indication was uh, they started to broadcast reports that they felt it was leaning and that there was a buckle in the northwest corner. 
And then as you and I were speaking live, uh, they said it's going, and it went. On the phone with us, I think from Washington at the moment, is Vince Canestrero, uh, with whom we often discuss matters of terrorism. Vince, can you hear me? Vince, can you hear me, Vince Canestrero? Okay, when we make it. One thing that's... Strange. Vince, can you hear me, Vince Canestrero? Yes, I can. Okay, well, I don't know what else to do at the moment except to ask your observations on this because... Just go ahead. Well, it's a, it's a pretty stunning uh, event, a sequence of events. Uh, I think most of the uh, intelligence information available to the U.S. government pointed at attacks at U.S. installations abroad, most recently in, uh, in Asia. Uh, I think that uh, no one uh, had really anticipated a major attack on U.S. soil. Why not? Come on, Vince. Why not? Why should I think no, because, in the wake of Oklahoma City, in the wake of the attack on the trade yeah. towers, and all this talk about international terrorism with its tentacles everywhere, why did nobody anticipate it happening here? I think they anticipated only uh, more sophisticated biological or chemical attacks from terrorist groups. But this was a, a series of attacks using conventional means. A uh, hijacked plane, suicide bombers. Uh, I don't think anyone in the intelligence community really anticipated that the terrorist groups uh, that they had identified had the capability to do these kinds of events inside the United States. Now, were they wrong? Obviously. Uh, and should they have anticipated uh, a level of uh, cooperation among alienated groups, uh, terrorist groups uh, that uh, wanted to punish the United States? Certainly, they should have. Uh, but I don't think anyone anticipated that any of the groups could have done this kind of uh, coordinated, synchronized uh, terrorist uh, events. Yeah, I want to know more about that, Vincent. I don't mean to have you have sure. to defend the intelligence community, but... No. Sure. We hear this all the time. Groups are not sophisticated to do this. Did right. the intelligence community fall in love with the notion of biological and chemical attacks and not anticipate that guys could hijack airplanes? They've been I, doing it since I the 1970s. I don't think there's any question about that. They were uh, anticipating new kinds of threats. Uh, all the money in the uh, counterterrorism budget went towards preparation for a BW uh, or nuclear attacks on U.S. soil. But uh, what we have seen time and time again, that terrorists mm. are able to exploit conventional materials uh, in a very devastating way. What McVeigh did at Oklahoma City in 1995, uh, using commercially available materials uh, to some devastating effect, although they weren't the casualties that we see today. But uh, 1993, uh, the... Uh, Hey, but Vince, let me, Vince, let me yeah, interrupt sure. you for a second, and, and I apologize. I sound no, like fine. on the attack here, but um, there is a, there's a feeling in the... You notice I haven't called anybody a terrorism expert this morning. I don't think anyone wants to be known as a Thank terrorism expert Thank you very much, and because, because but we have a series of terrorism experts who appear in our lives and sound and sometimes sound off knowledgeably. I exclude you from this, by the way, otherwise I wouldn't raise it in your presence. Sound off you know, knowledgeably about uh, how we know this group and that group and that group. And this is, among other things, a desperate failure of intelligence uh, in both the human and technical area. Am I right? There's no, there's no question about it, Peter. It's a, it's a major intelligence failure, the inability mm -hmm. to anticipate this kind of uh, a terrorism event on U.S. soil. I, I think that uh, they were focused on bin Laden in Afghanistan. They were focused on U.S. facilities abroad. And I don't think they believe that bin Laden or a consortium of groups collaborating together had the capability mm -hmm. or the willingness to do this kind of thing. As, as Is Mike, that a, a false assumption? Obviously. Yeah. Uh, we saw what they did with the USS Cole uh, last year. Uh, it was a very sophisticated U.S. warship that was almost totally destroyed with the loss of 17 lives uh, by uh, suicide bombers. Mm -hmm. And just one other thing before I let you go back and, and work the, the sure. beat for us, if you would, and that is Osama bin Laden. Mm -hmm. Some of my colleagues and I argue here about the U.S. emphasis on bin Laden. It's bin Laden, bin Laden, bin Laden. It's if the United States has only one focus at a time 
right. in, in terms of somebody involved in terrorism. Ha, has the intelligence community fallen in love with the notion that only bin Laden can do this? Uh, no, I don't think they have. They certainly have focused on bin Laden as the, as the bete noir and as the, uh, the architect of terrorism against U.S. officials, U.S. citizens. But in this case, uh, the, the uh, resources and the coordination and the direction to do these kinds of events requires capabilities beyond any one single group. In other words, there had to be cooperation, possibly with some state support, uh, to do this kind of thing. Okay. I mean, we've been hearing uh, for the last uh, two months that bin Laden was getting ready to do something, but I don't think anyone was looking here as the object of his, his next event. Okay, Vince, I much appreciate it, and I hope you go work the beat for us and you check okay. back with us.